Aubameyang, can he find a way through? You bet he can. That is top, top class. It's Arsenal's day. Arsenal extend this record. Good evening and welcome to the final in a series of FA Cup webinars. First, we reviewed the player development journeys of Mason Mount and Bakayo Sacco. Then we looked at a team analysis of Arsenal and Chelsea. And tonight we're going to look at the story of the FA Cup final, where Paul Davis, beloved Arsenal, beat Chelsea in the final. My name is Matthew Armsworth. I'm our host this evening. We've got Paul Davis, Jimmy Gilligan and Stuart Delaney to provide their expertise from a coaching perspective and an analysis of the final. Evening, fellas. Evening. Good evening, Matt. Hi, Matt. Right, so I guess we'll we'll kick things off with um, paying some some great credit to to Laura Seth, who's in the in the chat, who called it was going to be a, a three four three matchup in the final, and that's exactly what it was. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna come over to you, Jimmy, first in terms of we spoke last week about uh, Chelsea in a back three um, and what it gave them. Um, just want to share that with the learners tonight. Yeah, um, thanks, Matt. Uh, obviously, the back three, as I see it, is um, it, it allows it allows some adaptability within your group and in your team, and uh, allows the adaptability with the players. So, uh, if you look on this slide that you put up there, it allows Reese James, um, it allows Alonso to get forward and actually get very high up the pitch, always knowing that you've got some um, some structure behind the ball in terms of Jorginho and Kovacic. Equally, I think. Working with the back three in terms of those three particular players, you've got a robustness in them, um, as we sort of mentioned on the webinar last week about uh, Azpilicueta, the amount of games he's played uh, throughout his career, but in particular for Chelsea, you've got um, you know you've got a physical presence there with with Zuma and uh, Rudiger, and and also I think you've got some athleticism there in the team that does allow them to be able to break forward and press higher up, which is what they wanted to do, so that you've got more bodies forward and higher up the pitch. Yeah, and, and Davo, we, we spoke last week about um, Arsenal's strength in, in, in their attacking areas, so their, their front three especially. Um, and and we, we sort of alluded to the fact that we're going to try and expose Chelsea. Um, did you see that in the, in the final on Saturday? Yeah, so... As we spoke about before, the the, the three strikers, uh, Aubameyang, Lacazette, and Pepe, uh, those those were the ones we expected to play, and they, they did play. And I think they played pretty much as we were expected, expecting them to play in terms of those type of runs in beyond uh, defenders. And we'll we'll be talking about it and showing you some clips later on around how they did that. But yeah, essentially. Those three were you know, the main threats, obviously, for trying to score goals um, in the way that we spoke about last week. And uh, also, just touching on Maitland Niles as well, his, his contribution, because I think he might have been a little bit of a surprise that he was chosen ahead of Saka, but it turns out that um, he had, he had a, an outstanding game and caused Chelsea a lot of problems going forward. Yeah, and, and we alluded to this sort of midfield battle in our in our webinars last last week, Stu, in terms of trying to defend counter attacks and, and and dominate possession. Do you just want to sort of pass your judgment on what you saw on Saturday? Yeah, I think it's with with the pace of the front three, you know, the structure behind the ball is really important, and you got Sabellas and Zaka really kind of lock onto Jorginho, but obviously leaving space uh, to the side of them, um, which they're quite happy to do. But what kind of really interests me was the um, was the kind of movement from like Tierney at the back because he went from a wing back position to a left hand side centre half position because Klasnitz didn't play, and what what it allowed them to do it allowed Maitland now to get really wide and try to um, certainly have attacks down the left hand side of the pitch, but in saying Maitland now being wild and wide and high with the Bamyang, it allowed Tierney then to go and occupy full back positions which you know he's really comfortable in doing, and obviously Bellerin being a right wing back sliding rounds, so it's like a back four in effect. So it's quite flexible and providing really good opportunities to um, certainly be consistent in generating second, third and fourth phase attacks. So I guess what we're, what we're saying is a really interesting tactical battle and, and hopefully over the course of tonight, we'll, we'll start to unpick some of that and, and how this, this sort of story unfolded. Um, so that brings me on nicely to, uh, to, to look at the, 
the chance creation from both teams in the game. So Arsenal are the, are the red line and Chelsea are the blue line. And we're looking at their expected goals, so the, the quality of chances they create. Um, Jimmy, being a Chelsea fan, um, dominating the first period of the game. Um, what were some of your observations from from what you saw on Saturday, within that, especially within that first 20 minutes? Yeah, as you say, Matt, the first 20 minutes, you, you know, you, you should never really judge it straight away, but you look at it and you think Chelsea could, um, you know, might run away with this game, just the sheer the sheer pace and power that they had um, and and how high they were playing in terms of pressing Arsenal, which was fantastic, which was what we'd seen in the previous game against Man United. You know, their desire to want to press high, to go and win the ball back. And also some of their um, link-up play with Giroud uh, and Pulisic and Mount was, I thought, was out, outstanding in the first, you know, first 22, 23 minutes of the game. And, um you know that resulted in the goal coming really early, which was which absolutely fantastic. Um, and then, you know, just as you, as you sort of already alluded, where it was like a, a complete change, and the graph shows it on on 20, 24, 25 minutes when the, when the goal the disallowed goal came, and you know how the game changed really. And and David, do we notice any any changes from an Arsenal perspective that that allowed them to to sort of get control of the game back? Well, it's um, as Jimmy said, uh, Chelsea really did dominate that, that first 20 minutes. And I think uh, when they got called in for the drinks break, it was clear that uh, I said to the manager, was just trying to remind the players, I feel, that of the game plan. I think I think I'll give credit to Chelsea. They, they come out and they didn't allow Arsenal to really um, uh, enforce their game plan. Um, but after that break, it, the game really did change, didn't it? And um, Arsenal were able to, and we'll, we'll be showing the clips later on and analysing it, but they were able to then impose their game on Chelsea. But I agree with Jimmy, the first 20 minutes or so, Chelsea almost almost overran Arsenal. And it could. he was thinking, well, this could be two or three. Stu, did you want to come in and have any observations where Arsenal obviously won, won the FA Cup final and the changes for that? Yeah, I think, I think the uh, the drinks break with Keen, I, I know we'll move on to that shortly in the next couple of slides, but just recognising when the opposition give you space. So like Jimmy alluded to, the both wing backs for Chelsea wanted to go high and wide, which gives space in the in the channel areas. So, um, you know, Arsenal have played to the strengths and got the ball in, into, a, into the quick plays as much as they could to try and put pressure in the back three. Yeah, so it sees me up beautifully. Uh, Rodney Wilson in the chat's already emphasised the importance of this drinks break. So the drinks break came at 23 minutes. At 25 uh, minutes was the disallowed goal for Pepe. And then at, at 26 minutes, they get the penalty, um, which they convert to go 1-0. Oh, so we're going to now try and unpick some of that some of that detail. So we've got a, we've got a picture here of, of that first half drinks break. Um, just as, as we get to that, I'm going to ask the, the audience in terms of what um, phase they're coaching. Okay, so that's going to come up on your screen now in terms of uh, what what phase are you involved in? So foundation, youth development, professional development, senior game or non. So if you can can answer that, which one you currently work within, um, that'll help us guide this question. So just just as coaches, as we as we first come into it, Jimmy, what are some of your observations of what you see the uh, Arsenal and Chelsea both doing within this drinks break? Well, what what I, what I see straight away, Matt, is that I don't see players all over the shop. I see both um, both head coaches or managers have got has got the attention of of the players, but in particular in in Arsenal's case, you've got um, the manager and the goalkeeper coach there with Martinez is on the pitch. So there's a little bit of instruction going on there. But I would say that for me, that this is a really vital part of it. And and we spoke a little bit prior. What's gone on to the before this drinks break? Because they know the drinks break is coming. But to see that in in a still shot, Matt, I think is great because the players, yes, they're taking a drink. They're not all not all eyes are on the managers, but I, I guarantee you that all ears will be on the managers. Um, and I think in in the, the the Arsenal situation, which David will talk about more than me, I think it was a chance for the manager to have what I'd call one golden minute of time. Um, you know, and, and we've talked about this on pro license stuff around the data, around what what half time gives you. Is this this is a one minute half time? 
and and the managers have to use that very wisely. Stuart, if I was just to come to you in some of that that planning to make the best use of that that golden minute, if we're, if we're calling it, what are some of the considerations for coaches? Yeah, I think Jimmy's completely spot on. You know, the clarity and the message from from the manager's key, but it's, we're only seeing a glimpse of the during bit. It's what comes before. So how do they plan for these kind of moments? Um, you know, there's, there's so much technology available now with so much information. Um, it's how do we kind of filter that information to make it really specific for the players? So by the time that minute's, minute's up, everyone's clear about what it is they need to try and do. Yeah, and just to link into the, to the audience tonight, so 40% are coaching within the, the youth development phase, 16% within the foundation phase. So if they're, if they're coaching lower down in the age groups, what are some of the considerations for getting that message across to, to, to younger players? Very, very probably similar to, to senior players as well, just keeping it as simple as we can because what, what professional players want to know is exactly what's going to make a difference. And sometimes you've got to do that with, with the younger players as well. So we can use different intervention styles, but sometimes players do need telling because you can ask a question in, in, the, in the moment and if you're not getting quite the right response from younger players, then yes, certainly ask more questions. But in, in the game situation, sometimes you might have to tell that individual and then follow it up after the game with some questioning around why they were thinking around what they were doing. So, yeah, so it's just being really clear about why you're doing what you're doing. And, you know, the individual he's connecting with, he will know how to kind of uh, talk and can, kind of connect with them individuals uh, to make sure they give them a, the best chance possible when they go back onto the pitch. Thank you. Um, and, yeah, just to make a point, we've, we've got some footage of Arteta within the game, so some of his communication within the game, which we'll start to unpick uh, mm -hmm. the video. So I'm just going to... I'm just going to bring it on into to what Arsenal's been doing within their, their FA Cup run. So they, they played a 3-4-3 against Sheffield United, Man City and, and Chelsea. Um, and from a data perspective, we noticed that attacking efficiency has increased, which is the, the percentage of how many times they're getting to be attacking third and then progress into the penalty area. So it's that conversion of attacking third entries into penalty area entries. Um, and, and by that, we, we mean they're getting into advanced areas of the pitch where they're more likely to score goals. Um, the Premier League data suggests that 86% of goals this year are scored within the penalty area. Um, so within that, if you get in there more often, you've got a you've got a better chance of scoring. So um, that, that's sort of their progression, and they've achieved a, a really high number in 75% in the in the final against Chelsea. Any any observations? Yeah. Coach? Matt, Matt, sort of with with the data, what, what part of me wants to know why? You know, what, why is it that that this data is saying what it does. Is it is it that, you know, Arsenal getting the ball wide, they're getting into um, goal-scoring areas quicker? Do they get the ball forward quicker, et cetera, et cetera? I just, you know, we, we put this data up in front of people um, and I, I feel that we should probably interrogate the data a little bit more than we do at times. So have you got any more detail around why that is, that it is what, what it is in front of us? And, we, and yeah, it's a, it's a great point and sort of my background as an analyst, Fuels that so in terms of like the shot conversion rate against Man City. Well, if you have less shots, then uh, your conversion rate is going to be high if you if you if you score two goals from them. So that is skewed by the, the fact that they score score two goals. Um, I guess what's interesting that in the Chelsea game for this, we've got some some analysis further in terms of actually how they did it. I guess is the the meaningful question. So we, we're looking at their their three four three um, and actually where they attack. So within the Chelsea game, 42% of their attacks came down the left-hand side. So now we find the profile. Is that because of strengths of Aubameyang and Nekla Mars that Dave has already alluded to? Or um, opposition weakness in Aspilicueta or James? Are they they're trying to unpick that? So it's almost how are they getting into those areas and, and what are their sort of trends within that? Dave, I know you've uh, Mr. Arsenal. So have you, have you got anything to, to add? Yeah, no, that's right. I think uh, it's clear to, to us all that Arsenal um, did target that area of the pitch to to uh, attack in this particular game. And those kind of those figures there kind of bear that out. So, you know, we'll show some clips in a minute around what we felt Arsenal used as, uh, in attack against um, Chelsea. Um, in this particular game, uh, just to just to 
highlight those figures that you've got there, 41% um, against Chelsea. But, uh, yeah, so, you know, Arsenal had Aubameyang and Maitland-Niles mainly working working that channel for, for them. And, um, Pepe on the right-hand side. And again, um, I have to wear a really, really good game. Um, so, yeah, it was... Uh, We'll show the clips in a minute and to, to, to just prove our point. And just for a final point on that, so we've we've put the possession uh, figures in these games to when they're playing a 3-4-3 in the FA Cup. Um, and that, that sort of tells us what happened. So against Chelsea and, and Man City, they, they gave up the ball and didn't dominate possession. Um, but actually, we want to really know why. So what did they do when they get it? Um, and that's some of the detail that we're going to start to unpick um, in the video. Stu, I know you've got a, a point about the midfield yeah no I think you know like you said the data tells you you know what happened but when you look at the footage certainly the Sheffield United won the, the, the other kind of webinar you know ours were expected to have more possession because they want to sit deeper they want to be uh, not lying balls over around or through to be fair Sheffield United because they want to try and hit on the counter attack when you start thinking about the amount of transitions which they may be um looking to force upon the opposition to try and get consistent um, structure behind the ball to try and get the second, third and fourth phase attacks. It's evident against probably the the, the more expensive sides that that's probably um, more of a focus for them. But, you know, what is kind of really clear to see is that they've got kind of a, an adaptability at doing a bit of everything, which is quite good. So I think it's just a uh, final point in this data. So actually, if you take an average of the possession, in a 3-4-3 across these games, it works out at 42.5%. And you notice that's skewed by the Man City game pulling it one way and the Chef United pulling it the other, and it just falls in the middle of the Chelsea game. So when we talk about data meeting what, what we want, then that, that's what we're sort of alluding to. But actually the detail is, is in the in the video, which we're going to look at now. So Matt, Matt, sorry, can I just finish with just saying before I know Davo goes on, is that it's a great example there of, of you know, using data to to enhance what you do as well and help the help your team. But the, for the coaches that are here in their environment now, don't be afraid to, to ask questions. Don't be afraid to interrogate the data. If you if you're not sure about it yourself, go and ask the question. But also, you know, get get your analyst to explain why, so that you can then give that information to the players as well. And that and that's really crucial, isn't it? Seeing the game through the, the manager's eyes and all all up, trying to understand what we're actually looking at and how can we then measure measure data around it. So we're just, we're just going to load some uh, some video clips up to, to sort of look at how Arsenal played in this three four three. Um, so we just we're just going to we're going to play the the video through through once um, to start with. Okay, and then we're gonna we're gonna slow it down and, and talk through some detail. So so Dave is going to take the lead yeah. on this. So these are some of the clips that we've highlighted out from from the game. And you can see there that you know, it's a long pass our defence into space. And then as Stuart mentioned, you know, that second phase in terms of regains. And Chelsea get the ball clear. So we're just gonna break it down a bit. So what we what we noticed was any time the opportunity arose for anybody on that left-hand side to hit those balls into those spaces. So we've got a situation here where um, Lack, uh, David's on the ball, Luis is on the ball, Shaka's highlighted there, just bringing um, Jorginho under the ball, we call it. So he's, he's coming away from where the ball's going to go. And so... Shaka knows exactly where the ball's going because they've we feel as though they've practiced this. Shaka's not going to get the ball here. He knows that. He's just bringing Jorginho under it and then he's going to deliver. So it's almost that like enticing, isn't it, Dave? That entice to go and look like you're going to want to receive the ball to, to drag players out of, out of the spaces. Exactly, yeah. Exactly that. So that allows that ball to go in with a bit more space around. We've highlighted... Um, uh, Nelson uh, Maitland there receiving the ball, making the run in behind the Chelsea's uh, defence, in behind James and um, 
Aspilicueta, who's actually Aspilicueta's way up the field, so he's out of the game completely. So this is this is the first one of the, one of the first few opportunities that see it again that Arsenal have had to play that game plan that they've that we feel that they've um, been practicing on. And you see Maitland Niles, it's almost a one on one situation now. Maitland Niles up against James. And on this occasion, he doesn't doesn't get much out of it. But they're up the pitch and they retain the play. And as Stu said, you know, the way that you can get a second phase. So now what we just want you to look on here is just where Pepe and Bellerin are joining up the play. And just look at the way to look at where what Pepe's looking to try and get into. So watch his movement. He's, he's trying. He's trying to get. He's trying to get in beyond Alonso there, the left back. Doesn't quite happen, but the intentions are there. It's how he comes alive here, isn't it? He goes. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, doesn't quite happen for him. It's very similar to the Man City clip, isn't it? Where Bellerin receives inside twice, yeah. let one be one on the outside space. Yeah, absolutely it's true. Yeah. It's amazing because we'll we'll touch on some other clips, which again will show up some similar clips to Man City. Um, there's certain patterns that teams play that come up come up every every game, and we'll see the same in this game here. So that was one of the first clips that we noticed in terms of what Arsenal were um, trying to do. The second clip. So just again, if you can just watch it through. First half. Getting the ball down the left hand side. Look at that. Fantastic pass. This was the one for the penalty. So, again, we'll just take you through that in a slow motion situation and just try and break it down a bit for you. So, even before that ball's going back, look at Tierney. He's off because that's what he's been told. That's what they've been instructed to do. He's not waiting around. He knows the idea is for him to get the ball. So, we move. Move it on. It's that set structure, isn't it? So this is his planned, the planned routine of, of, a, of a game plan coming into action. Yeah, and the skill to do it because this ain't. He's got to turn his body. He's got to open his body up and good touch. So we wanted to highlight here, make the Niles away again. He's not. He's not going in the other way to take the Chelsea players into that area where the ball's going to go. He's he's bought in. Um, Chelsea is that is that James? Yeah. So yeah. James in closer to him, and then that ball's on over the top, and he knows that they know that, and it's a one-on-one -on -one again. Exactly as they played a fantastic ball that that's a pass. That's not, that's not a kick. That's to me that's a pass. Some people will get it's a kick out. I think it's great how Bamian just steps to his left hand side to put himself in between the, the ball and Nasper of Quetta. Yeah. Make the decision for him. I'm just going to replay this bit in terms of just that. Just look, if, if you can look again. He opens up his body. Up, opens up his body. Great touch. Maybe so now brings, brings him the other way. But the quality to do it, it's one thing them saying it, but to be able to do that. And again, the, the spaces that we, we felt that Arsenal were trying to um, get to. They did that for quite a large part of the game. Stu, so, and that, uh, that's something we alluded to in the in the Arsenal front three, and, and Jimmy spoke about Chelsea's his back three perhaps being susceptible to that longer range pass, which was clearly evident in these in these first two clips. Yeah, it's very very considered. Like like David was saying, it's not just a a kick up the pitch; it's a considered pass into a really good area. But you look at the first clip and the second clip now, you've got different types of movement coming from the different three players up front. So the first one, you had a bang me going short to make the Niles going long. This time yeah. you had a dropping in. Mm. You know, it, it kind of disrupts and causes a little bit of chaos around the no, We're going over the same clip. Are we on to the next yeah. clip? 
Uh, yeah, just 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 playing for, for Jimmy. I don't know if you've got a point. Oh, yeah, sorry, just uh, it's it's an interesting one, Matt, because looking back at the game, um, seven minutes twenty, I had it down as the um, Arsenal try that with Louise. He, he hits, I think he hits a right footed ball over the top, but that that gets cut out. So uh, for me, looking through the game and seeing the patterns that. Paul's talking about, you know, and Paul, I would yeah. totally agree with you. What t- that's a great pass, you know, that's a, a a measured pass into 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 the space for a Bamiang to run onto. But this is something they must have worked on, or something they've identified in the weeks leading up to this game that they were going to do. You know, hopefully, hoping I'm assuming Chelsea were going to play a back a back three. But um, for me, I just think that James is too high. Um, on that particular one, you know, and I know it's not about that, but that's what I think could have happened. Yeah. Oh. So, just a couple more clips just to, to highlight the um, points that we've got to make in the way that. So, just Arsenal... on this one is is what we alluded to before in terms of our tech coaching within the game. Um, so, we're just going to play this first bit through. We've left the we've left the audio on um, perfectly for us. The microphone was just just to the to the left of Arteta um, on the touch. So it's picked up imperfectly. So we're just going to leave you to, to watch some football and listen to, to some of the detail he's given in-game. We're just going to take you through and some of the some of the points that we've uh, recognised there, and hopefully you could hear the, the, the talking going on there. It's a fascinating opportunity now to to actually hear what what's going on. I actually I don't know about you guys, but I actually do enjoy watching the games without the crowd background noise. I don't know how do you guys watch it. Do you watch it with the noise or not? It's been it's been good, Paul. No, I don't generally watch it with the noise. It's, it's just been good to hear the players, I think, and yeah. and some of the stuff that's going on. Obviously, you know, Matt's picked up on this and mm. we couldn't probably have, or someone couldn't have placed a, the microphone in a better place for us on this this particular, you know, um, clip, yeah. really. What about you, Stu? Do you watch it with the noise or the crowd noise in the games? Yeah, I, I watch it with the crowd noise, yeah, I have to mm. say. It's... Um... It's Sorry. been quite interesting watching it through this kind of period, but no, fascinating to get a manager's insight to the information, what he's given the players and how he's helping them. Yeah. That, 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 in the chat that, that, about him using different languages. So he's, he's, he's speaking Spanish um, and then he's with Tito Bios. Um, yeah. And I know, Jimmy, you picked up on some of the some of the nuances of that when, as, as we just play this clip. So actually what he's saying to try and... Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, yeah. It, at times, I feel Paul that he, you know, he want he, he wants the game done sharp, and then at times he's, you know, he's talking and those people that are on the call that speak other languages, uh, and I don't know if I pronounce it. He's talking about tranquilo, tranquilo, which is is calm as or relaxed, basically, you know, he, and he wants them to build up, and then I think he wants the ball speed nice and sharp. So you you look to his time working with Guardiola. So that's something that Guardiola does. He wants the ball move quickly and wants it sharp. And then he wants them to be calm going to goal so that they're calculated in what they do. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and the bits that we want to highlight to our viewers here is the way that so Maitland Niles is kept, he's, he's keeping wide on the touchline as his managers instructed him to. And in this occasion, he's still trying to get in behind into that area that we we feel that they've been they've highlighted as a weakness as Chelsea's. So he just highlighted um, Maitland-Niles here because he's made a run to get in there behind. 
Yeah, I think it's really interesting clip as well, isn't it? Because they're showing lots of calm, mm. lots of patience. But uh, Sabalas there has a little check to see where Bamyang is. I think he was expecting him to come across that first defender to try and play a different type of pass. That's when he turned out and just kept the ball and recycled. So, as we've kind of mentioned already, there's certainly um, part of the kind of game plan is to try and penetrate the left-hand side of the pitch. And they'll show patience at times to try and open that kind of space up. And it was like there, Jack is going no. So it was almost like build again. Let's build again. Let's get ourselves set. And then with that path into that into that wide channel, and especially down the left, Sabayas so almost going to that false fullback position to, to go and expose an overload out there. And I think this is going to be like an evolving piece for Arteta, isn't it? So you can start to see how we might want to play in the future, but still maximising the plays he's got at the moment. Absolutely, yeah. players, isn't it? About making making runs and constantly doing the right things. I know you've, you've emphasised Nathan and Miles again here. If you if you keep oh, that, sorry, still, yeah. so we keep we, we keep. Sorry, Jim, go go I, for it. I was going to say, sorry, you might be saying the same thing, Davo, but you've paused it at a great point. So if if the if the coach is on the call, look at Arteta. He's got he's going at he's going at Maitland Niles, and you know he's giving him a pure pure instruction, and he and he you hear him shout Ainsley. He knows that ball's going over the top. So he wants Ainsley uh, 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 Maitland-Niles to run, which you've already put the arrow. But, you know, for, for the people out there at times, you know, you are going to be instruction-led. As, as, a, as a coach, you're going to be instruction, giving players instruction. It's not always going to ask them to work it out themselves, especially as you go higher up. Now, you'd ask the question, if there's 95,000 people in this stadium – are, is is Ainsley Maitland Niles going to hear what the manager's saying? Possibly not, but it's a great opportunity while while he's got that the the quiet stadium to do this with his players. Yeah. It's almost a question you ask yourself: of What do my players need? So what what do they need right yeah. now to help them? And, and that's the decision Arteta has made that, that that in the heat of the battle is, is what Ainsley needs right then. And if you go back to if you know we've had a question in from one of our guys is uh, you know how how do they coach this? So if you if you go to the manager of Arsenal, Paul, and it's, you know again it's your club. What would this look like on a, on a training pitch? Would would he would he be shouting out instructions? Would he be screaming at him? I, I guarantee you he probably would if he didn't get out of it what it was. Um, and again, I'd say to the learners in there, think about your practice design. How can you get this out? I've seen someone some other person in the chat say about Arsenal haven't played with this kind of long ball in in, in years. You know, and it, call it whatever you want. I think it's genius from the manager to change a tactic to outwit an opponent. Yeah. And 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 the the quality of the play at this level is is outstanding, isn't it? So the quality of the passing, the quality of the movement, so the timing, the timing here is is perfect. So he's made yeah. he's made his move, made a nose when he knows that the ball can be delivered, and. The timing to do that and the actual quality of the ball is is there for everybody to see. So these players have got the capability of doing what's being asked of them. Yeah. Expectations. So coming back to what you're saying, Jim, and what you're saying, Stuart, is you know what are the expectations of your players that uh, you the coaches are working with, you are working with the players you're working with, I should say. Yeah, it's amazing how many times Pepe gets a chance to come back on his left foot and put a cross on, isn't it? Yeah, in the yeah. it's a game we see it in this game as well. It's it's kind of no surprise. It's you know he's put himself in a great position for the over hit cross so he can keep the attack alive, and then he gets opportunity to come back on his left foot and put a cross in. So, yeah. so this is the um, final kind of example in the second half, similar type of thing. So. Tenny's come deep, but he knows he's just going to help it on. He's helping his he's helping his body up, and then we're just going to pause it. Or we'll take it through this point, and then we we'll pause it a second. I know some people thought that was a foul, but I didn't. <laughs> just, just Jimmy. <laughs> Great things. We'll just walk you through some of the stuff that we we felt was. Um, Poignant in this move. So just uh, Tierney has a look, sees sees where he is, sees the picture, knows what he's going to do as it comes to him.
So yeah, so we just wanted to highlight here as as Belly just before Bellerin gets the ball, which you know what Pepe and Abamyang are looking to try and do again, just looking to try and get in behind the uh, Chelsea defence. And it's movement and it's movement across the team, across different positions and different units. It's it's really hard as a as an opposition. The ball, the ball breaks now to Pepe. We see these, we constantly see these. As, as you were saying, Stu, these are the sort of pictures that we see, we've seen against Man, Man City. And I'm sure um, it was similar at, uh, when they played against uh, Sheffield. Sheffield. Yeah. So the Sacco to take the defender out to open the pass him up for Pepe. It's exactly. Yeah. The kind of opposite yeah. now we're making a different type of run to try and free the pass it to Abamian. Exactly. So we move it on. That's selfless. Just Abamian just waiting, just holding his run, not going offside, making sure that Pepe can actually get the ball to him. Um, just holding himself from not being too eager to get in front of the goal. And this is a this is a one on one situation, and we 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 start to talk about in our courses at the A license, and you know, although it's the team we're talking about, we're also going to introduce these situations where you're going to be one on one. So, um, Bamiang after the game said that uh, Zuma was actually teasing him. It's almost Zuma saying, "Go on, then, if you fancy yourself on your left, I'm going to give you that space on your left hand side." And he, he did, and he took it. He, we wish he hadn't done that. And it's that improvisation in the moment, isn't it? So they, like you say, Zoom has done all the analysis to stop him coming inside and and, and curling it in. So what, he didn't think he was going to go down his left. I think that's what he was, because he knows he's right for it. So yeah. this is from a different angle. I think it's really interesting, Dave. Always the pass from Pepe. So initially, he could possibly yeah. say maybe a poor pass, but it's not going in front of him to try and give a Bamian time. Yeah. Because it's into his right foot, and maybe Abamian has had the chance to take a touch to stop Zuma and get into yeah. set, then it allows him to manipulate the ball to get Zuma in a different position. If the yeah. ball Pepe now is playing in front of Abamian, then I'm sure Zuma can close him down and close the line and make the angle a bit tighter. Yeah, but I think passing now to his right hand side, you just watch Zuma as he takes a touch back in, it sets him, so it now gives Abamian that kind of um. The advantage we can still go on the outside, he's got the space to do so. Yeah, it'd be interesting to know from Pepe if, if that's that was his full thinking. Whether you know, I'm going to put it on his right side because I know that's his stronger side. Um, but we'll never know that, will we, unless, unless we meet him and ask him the question. If you want to see him now as he, as he starts to go, he has to set himself, which creates space on the outside of him. That's a good finish. Even though you could say maybe the keeper could make himself a bit bigger. Yeah. <clears throat> just for just for Dave's enjoyment, we're going to watch it from all angles just to just to celebrate the win. It's not a bad celebration either, is it? If, if you've got that. <laughs> <clears throat> So there's this great comments coming in the chat from Rory about this um, being unselfish and helping your, your teammates out, so making runs for others. I know Lacazette, Lacazette does that in, in that instance. Um, I'm just going to throw a question out to you guys um, as we as we move the conversation on in terms of this this strategy. So Alex Harrison's asked that that long ball is not considered a, a long ball if they're trying to create a positional superiority. So they're almost trying to play through that first line. Um, so I'm going to throw out the question to you guys: of Do you do you put your players in a in a certain strategy? Okay, so do you pick your players for a strategy, or do you base a strategy around the players that you've got in front of you at that moment? I think for me, Matt, um, if if I'm looking at the the two guys in in the, in the shot, certainly um, the Arsenal manager right now, I think he's um, got a strategy for the players because he's gone into the club you know he needs one or two transfer windows to um, rejuvenate uh, the squad and I then think it will be players for a strategy you know Alex Harrison 
talked about our tennis players entrenched in the principles of positional play. Yeah. So with what he's got at his disposal, I think he will have a strategy for those players. Um, and that strategy will be to get the best out of those players and also the best for the team, uh, the best for the football club. I think with um, the coaches that are on, on the call tonight, uh, which is why I wanted, I was interested in the poll, is that, you know, in academies, other than through the recruitment, the coaches don't get a choice of who they pick and who they don't pick, other than, you know, for the games of the weekend, but who they've got to work with. And I think that you are working with your players uh, as opposed to a strategy. So, you know, your players have got to fit the strategy that, that, you, that you pick for them. Um, so, you know, from my point of view, I would say if given an ideal world, I would, I would pick my players for a strategy, not a strategy for the players. And then that would be saying to me and to, to you guys that I've been able to buy and pick and recruit what I want to now allow me to go and, and put those players into the strategy that I want to play. Don't know what Dave or Stu would think on that, but that's, that's my, my sort of feeling. Yeah, no, hundred percent, Jimmy. I think the uh, the bottom statement is probably the one that's probably true for maybe both managers at the moment. And as they maybe evolve and go through certain transfer windows, they can maybe start to recruit and the team becomes their own. But I suppose it's um, it's such a short life being a first team manager now. You've got to win immediately. Um, you've got to really consider, you know, what your strengths are. So. Arteta, for example, because obviously that's the team we're talking about tonight. Is um, they've got pace up front. And they understand that maybe they don't show a lot of control and patience. So they know they've got transitions. So the structure behind the ball is really key in their kind of strategy to try and give them success, to try and get a consistent uh, way of attacking and getting more opportunities to try and get inside the box. Um, that may um, change as he maybe gets different types of players in to try and get a more controlled mm. professional game, which I think from from the, the clip where Arteta's coach from the side you can certainly start to see that kind of developing. Um, but I suppose it's a matter of just trying to um, get wins while you start to shape and develop the team. Hey, Van, I've got a yeah, question. No, absolutely, absolutely agree. agree the room tonight in the, in the YDP. So so being inside the club as you do, what are some of the, the, the decisions that you make on players um, throughout the, the pathway that can, can, can bring players to Arteta at the first team? <laughs> So, sorry, Matt. I, was he? I didn't quite get that. Was that question directed towards yeah, me? I didn't quite. Get it. In terms of what what sort of uh, things influence coaches' decision making when they're bringing players through the pathway, through the pathway at Arsenal to fit that to fit that style. Yeah, I, I totally agree with what the guys has just said there. Um, what interested me around the selection on or Arteta's selection on on uh, the weekend was that uh, he played Maitland-Niles in, in the left, left wing-back position. And um, there's an interesting... It worked out in the end, and Maitland-Niles had a really good game. Uh, but Maitland-Niles has played a lot of his games this season as a right-back. And um, he grew up at uh, in, the, in the youth teams playing at, as, as centre centre midfield uh, and it'd be interesting to find out uh, if he ever has played at left wing back because he's a right footed player um, and often that happens to young players they get put into the first team squad and the manager says look I, want, I need you to play here and I want you to play here and um, they've got to have the capability to, to, to adapt and do it uh, I think it's, it's a really interesting one because I, I think Maitland Niles. I, I don't know how many times he would have played at left wing back. And it'd be, uh, we've got a couple of um, Arsenal coaches on the pro license, and I intend to ask them because they they will know. Uh, it's an interesting one, and it was uh, it was mentioned the other day about uh, it's mentioned about Saka. Yeah, um, we spoke about his shoe, didn't we? And we had a webinar around Saka and his, his sort of development. And um, one of his youth team coaches was saying that he didn't play, he's never played on the right-hand side at youth level. 
But yeah, when he got into the first team, he was asked to pound the right hand side. But he was he was okay. He, he dealt with it really really well. Yeah. So you know the, the, these kids have have to be able to take on information, even if they haven't played in that position. If a manager wants you to do something at this level, as Jimmy said, you've got to be able to produce it. Yeah, I think, really good point. Point. Yeah. I think the um, you know th through the work the academy is obviously doing with putting players in different positions to give them a variety of experiences certainly allows a manager to have more flexibility in the strategy he tries to give to the first team players. But I think you know going back to your question Matt, around the wide EP and certainly FP, he's making it all around the individual player. So what does that what does that individual need to try and have the best opportunity of being successful? And it's just variety to, um, you know, variety in certainly different positions, but also different experiences against different styles of football. So, you know, the conversations have been about considered pass into um, into the kind of channel, which might not be uh, the norm. So how many times did maybe we potentially ask our kind of defenders to go and defend big spaces in behind them and get them defending face to their own goal? It's just understanding around what the individual player needs to try and give them the right tools and the toolkit for when these first team managers get them to try and put them into some kind of team and actually go and kind of deploy a strategy. And that's and that's our role as coaches, isn't it? It's not a criticism that the players aren't capable if we've never given them the opportunity. So it's that that variety of experiences again to to go and test them in different in different circumstances. Um, so we, that's, that's something we're encouraging all the coaches on the call tonight. Whatever age and stage you work with, actually, can you can you give your players a rounded profile so they can go and, and meet the demands of whatever the modern game looks like that is is forever evolving. I think we I think we're bang on forty five minutes. That was that was well rehearsed, fellas. <laughs> <laughs> kept it kept it well to time. So uh, fascinating insight. Um, it was a fascinating fi final. Um, nice to see Arsenal get some some silverware and Europa League. Um, as we shared shared through the night, there's there's a link to the the FA Cup uh, webinar series. So if you want to review Bakaya Saka's development journey, Mason Mount's journey, Chelsea or an Arsenal team analysis, they're there. This will be shared um, tomorrow on our FA Learning YouTube page. If you want to review any of the content, all that leaves me to say is thank you, Jimmy. Thank you, Stu. And thank you, Davo. Um, thank you. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Enjoyed it. And we hope to catch you on another FA Learning webinar very soon. Thank you.